Hello, I'm Gareth Roberts and welcome to a very special interview from Edgehill University with Honorary Doctor Professor Phil Scraton. Uh, Phil, first of all, welcome back to Edgehill, a place I know that's dear to your heart after 21 years uh, working here. You're, you're back here today to talk about something else dear to your heart, which is campaigning for truth and justice for the victims and survivors of the Hillsborough disaster. Um, I wanted to start with you know, much of what we know now and what is central to the Hillsborough story, the cover-up, the altered police statements, the suppressing of evidence, the uncovering of those facts. A lot of that began right here, Edge Hill, with you and your team and the Hillsborough project. So first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about that and how that started. I think that when Hillsborough happened, in many respects, you could say, as a Liverpool fan myself, who travelled a lot and been to all other semi-finals, it was a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, we'd seen so many near misses in previous games, previous semi-finals, uh, and, and at Hillsborough on the Leppings Lane Terrace. We'd seen very close to that. And if the, at that point, I think it was Spurs and Wolves were playing. Right. And if that, uh, at that point, if there had been perimeter fences, there would have been deaths. So the warning signs were all there, and I think fans knew that. I was a fan myself, and we knew the crushing. We knew the crushing at the turnstiles. We knew what it was like when, when you got in. Hillsborough was only the second semi-final in many years that I missed, and it was because I had very young kids. And when I saw live on television breaking into the snooker that was actually on that afternoon, what was happening on the terraces, it was almost beyond comprehension, but at the same time, it was like, this, has, this is the tragedy that we've waited for. And I knew right away, right at, from the outset, I didn't expect that eventually it would be 97 people who died, but I certainly expected there would be a minimum of 20 or 30 who died. And my emotion that day was to uh, leave where I was living in Berska and uh, to travel into Liverpool where I was meeting one of my former associates from Edge Hill, Paula Skidmore. We were actually planning a book on prisons and we were, we'd arranged to meet that evening in the Crown. And our meeting turned into a wake, really, there and then, because fans were coming back, coming in, they didn't even know each other, many of them. It was on the small television up in the corner of the bar. And we were watching beyond belief as the figures of those who died, the figure was rising. And as people were coming in, and this was the, this is a really important point for me. As people were coming in, they didn't know each other, but they told an identical story. They hadn't rehearsed it. Mm. They were in different parts of the pens, pen three and pen four, uh, and they told the same story. And that was the story that was clear from the outset to me. And it, to a certain extent, it became clear in the next day, the, in, the, in the Sunday papers. Uh, there was much more latitude given to the fan stories in the Sunday papers. But within days, the mood had changed. And in days, we knew that they were going to put the responsibility onto Liverpool fans. And so that early day, those early days, and the point of saying that, is that I knew that we had to use the skills that we had as researchers. And I'd done a lot of research into controversial deaths in controversial circumstances. I'm a founder member of Inquest, which is a deaths in custody um, campaign group and charity. And now a, now a very large group, a, the, the most important group on contested deaths. And I knew that we would eventually be having to face a, an inquest, we'd be having to face possible court cases, all of that, and I put all the resources I had here at Edge Hill into that project and made a proposal to Liverpool City Council to set up the Hillsborough Project, and we did. The Hillsborough Project was set up in the autumn. We produced our very first report within a year, substantial report, um, called Hillsborough and After, and in the meanwhile, the decisions were taken that there would be no prosecutions. The inquests uh, were on the horizon, but at that time it was the Taylor Report. Yeah. 
And the interim report of Lord <coughs> Justice Taylor, I think everybody considers that was a, a major moment. It was, but it wasn't the major moment that I think a lot of people interpreted as being. Yes, he, it was obvious the cause was overcrowding. The main reason, he said, was basically lack of police control of the crowd. That was, to a certain extent, true, and he criticised the senior officers who'd gone to the Taylor inquiry. He said that those senior officers were less than truthful. I know for a fact now, years on, and I never had the opportunity to interview him, that when his final report came out eventually, which covered a whole range of other tragedies and disasters that had happened in the meanwhile, and Hillsborough was hardly mentioned in his main report, when that came out, I felt he'd backtracked. And I now know for a fact that he felt he'd gone too far with his interim report in terms of directing the responsibility to the police and only the police. And that was the end of it, really, in terms of the story that was sympathetic or empathetic to the Liverpool fans. That was more or less the end of it. After that, what we saw happen was a backtracking. Um, there were no prosecutions. So despite the fact that he'd been saying police, you know, senior police officers, lack of control, all of that, there were no prosecutions. Uh, once that was out of the way and there were going to be no prosecutions, the inquests resumed and the inquests went the full way. And I'll say something there about one of the problems I had at the time. The same police force that had been uh, called in to look for criminal prosecution, the West Midlands Police, were the same police force, was the same police force, that informed the coroner, the inquests. And to me, I felt it was going nowhere. In fact, when the coroner was sitting there in, in his court, to his side was the deputy chief constable of West Midlands. And I felt that the inquests were being directed. There was also, in the law, we call about inequality of arms. And what that actually means is, if one side has more investment or more barristers than the other, that's an inequality of arms. The Hillsborough families, <coughs> the bereaved, they had one barrister and a team of solicitors. The other side had six or seven barristers representing different elements of the South Yorkshire Police or the South Yorkshire Ambulance Service or whatever, the, the, all the official bodies. So that when you had a witness, they would have six or seven uh, attempts at discrediting that witness, whereas the families only had one. And the coroner, without any question, and I've written this uh, more than once, directed the jury towards an accidental death verdict. Now, an accidental death verdict theoretically can encompass negligence but that's not what the words say, and that's not what the popular discourse was. That's not what the newspapers said. This was an exoneration of, of, of the police and any of the other authorities, the ground, the owners, all the rest. It was an exoneration of them at the same time as being very specific in saying they died by accident. And that was the end of the inquest, so no prosecutions, accidental death verdict, then we go to appeals, the appeals are dismissed, then we go on into the 1990s, getting towards the end of the 1990s, the campaigns are up and running. There was an attempt by the, Labour gov the new Labour government in 97, the Blair government, there was an attempt then to rekindle what, what had happened in terms of investigation and inquiry. And I have to say that eventually that too came to nothing. And at that time, I was working at Edge Hill. The team was based at Edge Hill. We'd written the two reports, two substantial reports, 1990, 1995, where we absolutely laid responsibility at the doors of the establishment and at the doors of those institutions. And 
they were shelved. They were lost. And in 1999, I decided to write the book Hills for the Truth. Jimmy McGovern had made the outstanding um, drama documentary that was went internationally. And I worked with Jimmy on that. Uh, and I got to know the researcher with him, Katie Jones, very well, who comes back into the story later because she was eventually on the Hills for Independent panel with me. And in that process, um, in that process, I just felt Jimmy's film was the beacon. And I had already discovered by following up on an interview I'd seen on television, a police officer who was being interviewed as part of a program called, I think it was Aftermath, about the aftermath of tragedies. And this guy, his name was David Frost, just said, the story that was told at Hillsborough is not the story that we as police officers witnessed and signed off on. And I tried to get hold of him and I tracked him down. He left the police and he agreed to meet me and we went walking on the moors. And that's when he disclosed to me that his statement had been changed. So I said to him, w w would you let me see the change statements? And he said, yeah. So the next time we walked on the moors, we also met in a cafe and he got a box file out and he put it on the table. I opened the box file and there was his, his statement in three forms. The first initial handwritten form, the typed form, which had altera altered alterations, 90 alterations on his, lines through sentences replaced with different words, signed off by what, it, what eventually I discovered was a team of six officers who were doing this on behalf of the South Yorkshire police, and then his third statement. And his third statement was pristine. And I'll never forget the moment because I said to him, as happens with police statements, I said, but your signature is at the bottom of every page. And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Phil, it is my signature, but I'm telling you I didn't put it there. I, I'm really that surprised about stuff that happens like that, but I was shocked. It was, it was chilling because I then knew this wasn't just David. This was all of the officers mm -hmm. who had been close to that pen. So now when I, when I wrote the first edition of Hills for the Truth, that was the big reveal that the officers' statements had been reviewed and altered. And then it covered what I, was in what I, was in what I felt was really important and that the voices of the bereaved and the survivors were heard. So it was based on multiple interviews with bereaved families and survivors who by this time I was close to. The book came out and I thought this was going to change everything because it had front page news. You know, it was, it was all over the place, especially the reviewed and altered statements. And nothing happened. And I left Edge Hill soon after in the early 2000s and I went to work at Queen's University in Belfast. And I'll be absolutely honest with you, I left feeling I'd failed. I'd failed the families, I'd failed the survivors. I'd done everything I could, but I'd failed. And it was, it was, you were up against a very powerful state. So that was that first phase. And you mentioned the book, and I just wanted to say on, on camera in this interview that Phil's book, The Truth, is really worthwhile reading. Uh, we can never do the full story of this justice in this short time, so do, do look the book up if you haven't read it. But one of the more shocking aspects of the story for me, I've read the book a couple of times, me and you have met before and, and had chats on camera before. Some of the opposition to your work, it, that took a bit of a sinister turn, didn't it, in terms of what was coming through to you? Before the book came out, but when I was being vocal, um, I was living in um, Bursko with my two boys. And for much of the time, I was in the house on my own with the boys. And I had a phone call one evening, beautiful spring evening, around five o'clock in the evening. And it was a cultured voice telling me that I wasn't safe and telling me that my kids left for school at a certain time in the morning 
I left for Edge Hill at a certain time in the morning. Sometimes I'd take them in. Detail that you could only get garner if you were actually keeping somebody under surveillance. Mm. And I can tell you, um, there were radicals that I knew who used to dream of being able to wear the badge of honor of being under surveillance by the police. When that happens to you, and it's you and your family, there is nothing there that is a badge of honor because the nerves are so great. I, it does exactly what it mean, it's meant to do. Should I continue doing this work? Should I, you know, what, what, what is going on here? So that was the beginning of it. I never felt that anybody would do anything. But what I did feel was that it was the warning sign. It was a shot across your bows. I went into the local police station and I told them, and they said, who do you think is responsible? And I smiled, I, I smiled and said, you're in the Lancashire police. You tell me who you think is responsible. And I left. Phil, you know, it was like, Phil, what, what, what are you suggesting? I said, you know what I'm suggesting? <laughs> and I went. And I mean, I've never got to the bottom of that, but things have happened since. Um, later on in the story, when I'm then living, um, still, still living in, in Bursko, um, and Norman Betterson had been appointed chief constable of Merseyside, and he'd been directly involved in the South Yorkshire Police. He was chief inspector and he'd been involved in the review and alteration of statements overseeing them. And um, I discovered that his past wasn't known. I later discovered it was because of the way he actually presented his application form. His past wasn't known in terms of the South Yorkshire Police. Um, and when he was appointed, uh, and I'd made some fairly strong statements about the appointment. He rang me at home on an ex-directory number. So, you know, there are all kinds of ways of having warning shots across your bows. Mm -hmm. He actually said to me, for the record, he actually said to me, am I in, it was just at the time the first edition of Hillsborough The Truth was coming out and he said, um, his words were, am I in your book? And I said, no, Norman, you're not as it happens. And he said, well, it's just as well. And he threatened me with legal action if I ever published anything about him. And then he went off the phone. And then it was about six weeks later that I got hold of his application form and all the stuff that was uh, underpinning his appointments in Merseyside. Still got all those documents. And so the second edition of Hillsborough The Truth, which came out within a year because it had been so successful, but also because the case had moved on, the second edition, I gave him 3,000 words of his own. And they've stood in that book ever since. It, it was the, the 35th anniversary of the disaster yesterday as we talk, yes, Phil. Yeah. And, and, and I wanted to sort of bring ourselves forward from what we've talked about so yeah. far and talk about a little bit about what you think the last and legacy of, of the Hillsborough disaster should be. I know you're involved in in a project around that, and maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. Well, before I talk about the direct legacy, I would like to just say and pay real tribute to the bereaved and survivors. I can be a conduit, I can write, I can gain access, I can do stuff on TV and all the rest of it. But the hard yards have to be walked by families who are bereaved, who have been injured themselves, who are losing loved ones prematurely on the, on the way. Eddie Spirit was one of my closest friends, a very, very sharp guy, really brilliant, a survivor. His son died in his arms. And he nearly died. And Eddie Spirit had the early onset of Alzheimer's. There is no doubt in my mind that the, what he went through in those hours when he was unconscious afterwards and was at one point left for dead, there was no question in my mind that that was that triggered it. And the reason we're talking about Eddie, apart from paying tribute to him and his family, is that so many others have died prematurely. So when I say 97 people died at Hillsborough, I always say, but we don't know how many people died as a result of, of, of Hillsborough. So carrying it on and being up to date is their legacy. They're the people who've done it. Their sons and daughters, their grandsons and granddaughters, young people who weren't even born at the time have carried the flame. 
and kept it going. So when it came, I was in Belfast at the time, when it came to the possibility of moving it on with a Labour government, and uh, Andy Burnham committed, I was on the COP that day at the Hillsborough anniversary, and he committed to his government moving forward. Uh, and I don't think at that mo moment he knew exactly what that meant, what it, what it would mean. But I wrote the draft for the Hillsborough Independent Panel with the families, and that was submitted by the families. And the Hillsborough Independent Panel was then appointed. And I, my position was, if we're going to be an independent panel looking at the full story, we have to have access to all of the documents. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of documents here. And if I'm going to look at hundreds of thousands of documents, I need a research team who knows, knows what they're doing. So it wasn't just about getting, uh, get, getting the Hillsborough Independent Panel and the expertise that the panel had. And my goodness, it was a strong panel. Raju Bhatt, the lawyer, who I was absolutely insistent should be on the panel, was brilliant and still is brilliant. Um, Katie Jones, who was the only other person who had direct knowledge of Hillsborough because she'd worked with uh, Jimmy McGovern on the film and she was steeped in it, the late Katie Jones. We lost a wonderful woman when she died a few years back. Um, that panel really had the opportunity then to go through these statements, go through all of the documents we received from all the organisations. And the team did it, the researchers did it, and um, we were steeped in it, and it took us two years. And people say, well, how long does it take you to write a report? No, how long does it take you to research thoroughly a report? Because every T had to be crossed, every I had to be dot dotted. We couldn't make mistakes. One mistake would bring the whole house of cards down. And when the Hillsborough Independent Panel came out, and we had multiple findings. That's when we knew the game had changed. I didn't realize it had changed as much as it had. We went to the Anglican Cathedral the night before it was launched, and it was a massive, you know, you'd have thought a rock band was going to be playing there, the width of the stage. And I got up in front of all the families and survivors in the crypt of the cathedral, and I just went through our findings. And I saw people in front of me breaking down. They, weren't le they were learning some things that were new. They were shocked by some of the revelations, but the main story they knew already. I think what really shocked them was it was in black and white, that it was published. There was a big, thick report of over 400 pages. That's what really shocked them, the detail. Right down to the detail of, for example, uh, the fact that when um, the medical evidence was constructed, and I say constructed, it was by a team of surgeons who worked through the nights. We discovered they used contaminated um, basins as they passed body parts from one basin to another. In other words, that contaminated the evidence. We also discovered one thing that we had a lot of discussion about. And that was that 41 of the 96 who died could have survived, did survive, and could have been saved had they had quicker, more speedy intervention. People had maybe thought this or said it, but we had the medical evidence now. We could say that. And that evening of the launch of the report, um, the doctor in the team, he stayed behind in the cathedral to meet all of those families individually to tell them if they wanted to know. So we were still having new revelations even then about how the evidence itself was not reliable. Even the medical evidence, the scientific med evidence was not reliable. That changed everything. You know, I think Theresa May was left as now the prime minister was left with no choice. And to hear those words, and I was in the crypt because they came straight in, it was beamed straight in from the House of Commons to the Anglican Cathedral, to all of us in there after we delivered the report. And they'd only seen the report that morning. 
And to see Theresa May actually saying, you know, Eric, that this was a double tragedy. You know, the double tragedy. First of all, that people died. But secondly, that the families and survivors had been put through this over that time. And then, of course, it all became clear. There would be new inquests and, all, and so on and so forth. There would be the potential for new prosecutions, which, of course, we know that didn't work out. But what did work out, and I worked with the legal teams throughout the two years of new inquests, the year of build-up and then the two years of the new inquests, what that did demonstrate absolutely clearly uh, was what the first inquest hadn't. And so we arrive at a verdict, and the verdict was that they had been unlawfully killed. That wasn't the whole thing. In the meantime, working with inquest, we'd got changes nationally to inquest verdicts, and one of the changes was that juries could now add narratives to explain their verdict. That narrative was absolutely crucial because what it said was that they'd been unlawfully killed, but it added why, and it absolutely laid responsibility at the door of the institutions. And the middle question that was the, the, the jury was asked was, did the fans in any way contribute to the deaths at that time of the 96? And the answer was simple, no. And it laid the myth in one moment that after all these years, all the stuff we'd written, all the, all the campaigns, we got one word which exonerated the fans. And to me, that was everything, because I knew some of those fans so well, and some had died on the, uh, uh, in the intervening period. But I knew some of so, them, and they were living with the burden of everybody in the nation, internationally even, believing one of the phrases I'll use in my talk, Scouse killed Scouse. That, that was actually printed, yeah. and you know that. There's so many, so many headlines that had been written in that respect. So that changed everything. Um, and that brought us up to the next phase, which I have to say, after all these years, that was 2012, and here we are 12 years on, and the, what is now called the Independent Office of Police Conduct has still not reported its findings. 12 years on, the most expensive and extensive investigation they've ever, they've ever mounted. Last one, Phil, we've got to wrap up. Um, how disheartening, how much does it sadden you that despite all the work you've put in, other people have put in, despite that we have the panel report, we have your book, we have the documentaries, we've established the truth. Um, how much does it sadden you that it's still leveraged at times, Hillsborough, for tragedy chanting for, you know, mindless posts on social media. How much does that sadden you as someone who's put so much into it? I'm sad to say that I expect it now. I expect it in, 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 all, in, in all forums of the work, all kinds of the work that I do. And I want to separate out the issue of ignorance and knowledge. Those who are ignorant are using it in the same way as they will chant uh, obscenities about football teams. They don't think of it any more than that because they've never lived through it. They've never understood it. They weren't even born at the time. And, you know, put it this way, I was a really strong Liverpool fan as a child. And when the air crash occurred in Munich, I had Duncan Edwards's, as a Liverpool fan, Duncan Edwards' portrait over my bed. And I was only a young child. And the exchange that there has been between two clubs that have suffered so much from disasters is dreadful. But it's not clubs. It's a small group of people who will use any weaknesses they see it to wind the others up. Now, I'm not in any way exonerating it or saying that that's, that's therefore understandable and we should pass over it. We shouldn't. It has to stop. And it is stopping. And I think that's the really important issue. However, the one thing that really does upset me 
is when I see older, usually, well, it's always men, older men, pardon me, when I see older men engaged in that behavior. That's different because they do understand the legacy. The young fellas are learning and all the rest. And that brings me to something really positive, which is that um, when Ian Byrne decided to set up and establish the Real Truth Legacy Project, that is to get into all schools the truth of Hillsborough. By all schools, yes, at the moment, we're confined to Merseyside schools, but we want to see that in all schools. And we don't just want to see it as Hillsborough. We want to see it as Munich and all other similar events so that people begin to realize as their children that these, these events have happened and they have a dreadful legacy. And in the pilots that we've been doing in schools, the responses from children, young children, junior school children, have been remarkable. The questions they ask, the concern that they show, and even their parents weren't born at the time. And yet they, when they hear that, when they understand it, so that's one of the great legacies, I think. The Real Truth Legacy Project is so important. The other is now the move towards the Hillsborough Law. And I think what this will mean, it goes far beyond Hillsborough. What this will mean is that when tragedies occur, when there are deaths in con controversial circumstances, they will be handled entirely different. People will have a right to thorough and full investigation. They'll have a right to legal representation, but they will also have a commissioner dedicated entirely to working with those families and ensuring that the rights of those families are safeguarded. Phil, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, really. It's a real pleasure, and I mean it. Thank you. Cheers, Phil.